Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we are excited to be here as we talk about cash in on your data assets with advanced analytics. We have an awesome speaker today. His name is Rick Young. He is the founder and CEO of Three Sage Consulting. We are so excited to have him here today to talk more with us. I just want to let you all know beforehand, there's a few touch points. Our webinar today is brought to you by ReadyTalk. We thank them for letting us use their service. If you guys have any questions about them, let us know at the end and we'd be happy to answer it. We also are saving the last 10 minutes of the webinar for questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and type in the box where you can ask them. I will be moderating, so just wait till the last 10 minutes um, and we can ask them to Rick from there. And also today's session is going to be recorded. Um, you can find it on our YouTube channel after we're done at Technology Association of Georgia. And also after the webinar, we're going to be sending out a survey, so we'd love for you all to participate um, and give us your feedback. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rick, and Rick, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Perry, and thanks to TAG for uh, hosting this event today. Uh, good morning. My name is Rick Young. I am the founder and CEO of Three Stage Consulting. We are an Atlanta-based management consulting firm specializing in really all things data, helping our customers uh, become data-driven and uh, manage their data as a strategic asset. So everything from big data to advanced analytics, master data management, governance, um, and everything that goes along with that. So one of our key uh, themes at Three Stage Consulting is that your enterprise knows more than it's telling you. And we're going to go into ways to tap into that with some of the uh, newer capabilities that are entering the market. So really want to uh, talk about driving data-driven enterprise. I know everybody's heard that, that phrase before, but the intent is to uncover hidden insights that are within the wealth of data that you're collecting uh, inside your business and also external data that can add context and color to that. So why should you care? So in a recent survey, we found that many companies are struggling to leverage analytics. Um, only 38% of business users have a clear understanding of how to really drive change um, in, in um, understand desired outcomes, what's driving those outcomes. And the uh, expectation is to leverage data to become um, better at our decision making, uh, but that's still not uh, prevalent in, in, in certain industries and business today. Only 20% of the time is data prepared. We spend a lot of our time um, integrating, massaging our information, so we're really not able to rapidly um, make decisions, and that time to value is getting stretched out to the point where by the time we're able to make a decision, everything has changed, situations has changed. So we're going to talk about how we can um, still find insights, but not have to go through all that, uh, you know, traditional data integration, ETL, uh, so forth and so on by leveraging um, advanced analytics and data discovery. And this is a big one. Only 28% uh, of the uh, responses say that they have analytic experts within the business, not IT. So they need expert guidance or um, some tools, so you know, we talk about people, process, technology. If you don't have really strong uh, analytic experts, then we probably need to um, improve the technologies to enable the business. So um, there are some ways to do that, to drive actionable desired outcomes by leveraging some of the newer uh, data discovery platforms. So keep hearing about all this data coming about. IDC estimates that it will grow annually at a 60% rate. McKinsey estimates that in the U.S. alone, there's going to be a gap of almost 200,000 workers with analytical expertise. I know that, I'm sure you all have heard that data sciences, um, analytics is one of the fastest growing uh, educational tracks, ma master's degrees, um, every university is adding those, but there's still a huge gap based on need. 50% of the firms is based on IBM uh, study believe that they are able to transform their industry, their company by, um, with data richness or analytics. Um, and analytically driven companies are 370% more likely to innovate around product, 
um, around customer uh, interaction and experience in basically generating revenue, reducing costs, or reducing risk. So 370% is a pretty big number. Um, so we probably need to care about this. So what would you do if you could listen to your data and your data could speak for itself, right? And what we're going to talk about is the difference between traditional BI um, and reporting techniques versus uh, data discovery and analytics. So you have the data, but can you answer business questions? Are you even asking the right questions? And are they driving desired business outcomes? So when we say desired business outcomes, one of the worst things you can do is get in front of a business user and ask them sort of requirements. What report do you need? What would you like on your dashboard? Because that type of interaction, the user in front of you is only going to tell you what they know. And the key is they don't know what they don't know. They're going to design the dashboard or the report in their head based on the data that they know about and the capabilities of the tool that they might know about. But the key is asking them, how do you know you're doing a great job? How do you know that your uh, team is doing a great job day to day, week to week? What um, are the key things that drive your success and the company's success? So we need to understand those things and then allow us as practitioners or analysts, data scientists, to leverage technology to tap into the data to get them the uh, dashboard analytics that they need to drive those outcomes. So they're hungry. We all know that. And we want to be able to enable them. Um, and one of the key capabilities that's really emerging, um, every day there's a new uh, platform tool company that provides this kind of capability. But it's really about data discovery and storytelling. Um, so. What that means is uh, getting into non-hypothesis-based um, analytics. So let, let's start at the basics for those that might not understand, you know, that are, are coming into this. And um, they're really based on Gartner. There are four types of analytics. There's the descriptive. So that's historical. What did we sell last month uh, versus last year? Diagnostic. Why did that happen? Predictive. What is likely to happen? So we start getting into some regression and other statistical models. But prescriptive is, what should I do? How can I maximize profit? How can I reduce customer churn? Um, so traditional BI reporting descriptive analytics tends to depend on the hypothesis. I'm going to build a report on sales by salesperson by region by product. Um, and that is definitely still useful. Um, it's not. Uh, super actionable, but you know we still need those types of descriptive analytics. But now we're able to use data to automate, and prescriptive analytics is really changing uh, the landscape. So driving business outcomes based on human input and decisioning is starting to be um, replaced with some data-driven suggestive technologies. And I'll, I'll talk about an example here in a second. But we can leverage our models um, to help us act in a way that will drive our desired outcome. So the other chart that I really love here is talking about those four types. The key here is looking at that green spot, you know, the green span of human input as you move down the spectrum of analytics. And um, you know, the, they all require a decision in order to make it, take an action. But what's interesting is when we get into prescriptive and start talking about decision automation. So one example of um, a, a, negate, you know, a customer uh, solution that we created, a um, basically call center uh, that handles all types of, of customer issues, uh, questions. And when a customer calls, they want their call center rep to help cross-sell, upsell. Uh, based on their purchase history, um, their uh, likelihood of, of making a purchase based on their, um, the segment that they fall into, based on their demographics, their purchase history, things like that. So what we created was a um, prescriptive decision engine that would create a uh, pop-up screen on the CS call center rep's um, uh, machine and say, hey, we'd like to offer you a package of Showtime and Cinemax at 20% off because the predictive engine 
decided that this is the price that they are most likely to buy this package. So we're, you know, really helping the CSRs understand what is the most likely behavior from the customer by leveraging the, the models that we're able to build. So we like to use this chart, um, and this talks about the, the paradigm shift. So here's a quadrant. Everybody loves quadrants, right? So if you look at the vertical axis, um, at the top it's things you know, at the bottom it's things you don't know. The horizontal axis at the far right is the questions you're asking, the far left is questions you're not asking. Um, so descriptive is really, you know, traditional business intelligence falls in that top right question. It's only based on the things you know. We're asking questions we know to ask based on the data that we know, the, the business scenarios that we know. So, um, you know, it's, it's a uh, typical we sold X more than last year. Diagnostic is looking into why, again. Um, again, it's based on the questions we're asking. We sold X more. That was the original question, but why did that happen? Well, it's because we lowered the price. So we're looking at price elasticity to demand and we understand, okay, well, we lowered the price and we sold more, but that, how did that affect margin, profitability, all that stuff. Predictive starts getting into um, areas of data discovery where we're not ask, necessarily asking the question, but we're allowing the data to tell us things that are driving our desired outcomes. So it can also tell us what the um, predicted outcome is going to be the most likely outcome based on you know, certain variables, like what is price elasticity, man? What price maximizes our margin? But that is really delivered by prescriptive um, with smart data discovery, and that is the capability of saying, you will maximize profit by setting price to Y. So it, it looks at, and this is a very simplified version of that, but it is um, really enabling us to understand the correlations between uh, profit, not just price, there are a lot of other things, but seasonality, regionality, um, weather depends on the industry, but the, the key is really tapping into the data, letting the data tell us what's going on by running thousands of algorithms and correlations and models without um, proposing some or having some predisposed um, hypothesis or question. It's really tell us what's going on by um, running through all the, the, the various scenarios and correlations um, of, of all of our data. So Gartner um, because of the, the advancement of technologies and the split of traditional BI, so the things on the right and things on the left here, um, they've created two market segments, traditional enterprise BI platforms and then the data discovery platform. So we're going to talk about the latter. So smart data discovery alternatives are um, different from traditional BI. They're highly interactive and graphical uh, with graphical user interfaces, but they have built-in statistical models to drive uh, understanding the correlations. So they will run, and we're going to talk about a few examples, but it will run every permutation uh, combinations of your data to find the true correlations of what drives the desired outcome, the thing you care about. Um, we're going to talk about an example uh, with patient, this is healthcare data, uh, extended stay. So with um, the Accountable Care Act, they're really looking at um, making sure we're able to take care of patients um, and, and hopefully not have a revisit or not have a stay that is uh, beyond their, you know, average for that particular diagnosis. So there is a maturity to get to this point. There are a lot of different things that have to be in place to get to that. So typically companies start with spread marks, really just uh, – pulling data into spreadsheets and, and doing what they will. It's really ungoverned, ungoverned um, but we're just talking about source data and it's really uninformed decisions. Then we build a data warehouse, we start integrating things um, and that's great and that gives us a more holistic view of what's going on. We can do things like descriptive analytics, what happened, and build traditional uh, reports and business intelligence. Now we need to start thinking about how do we make sure our data is correct, it's trusted. So we start talking about data governance, and we want to look at a customer or a product or a vendor holistically. What are all the touch points? How do we uniquely identify a customer? 
how do we map all the products across business units? So that's where we start getting into master data management, where now we have trusted data and we can start doing a little deeper analysis. Why did these things happen and make sure that those questions and, and the results are accurate. But as we mature, we start getting into big data, external data, social media, start enriching and, and, and growing our data sets. Then we get into advanced visualizations, Tableau, Click, you know, those types of tools, but those really still depend on, um, you know, manual data discovery, uh, looking at visualizations and pulling in certain data elements. Um, but still that enables us to look at some predictive outcomes, um, which is, you know, still light years ahead of um, where we were five, ten years ago. But now we have smart data discovery capabilities which allow us to automate prescriptive capability or um, solutions that will provide the business users with a very um, accurate view of what's driving their outcomes. And once we have that, we can embed those analytics into our, our um, transactional systems at the point of sale. Uh, so at a um, large convenience store with a uh, customer um, Retain or customer uh, loyalty system, when they come to the register with certain products, we can predict what they might buy in addition to what they have on the counter. So now we're becoming data driven, and that's really you know the goal of uh, of every business user is to to make more informed decisions and let the data help us um, drive desired outcomes. So the evolution of Smart data discovery. You know, first generation was typical um, BI tools, Cognos, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, MicroStrategy. So we had reporting based on queries, at dashboards, OLAP, Enterprise BI. Um, generation two was um, a huge advance in our capabilities. Tableau, Click, Domo, Power BI. So now we have self-service. We have visualization, but still has a lot of manual. Um, you know, need for manual uh, analysis, uh, not really allowing the data um, and automating some of those discovery capabilities. Well, the third generation is really around smart data discovery. So some, uh, you know, some uh, examples there, Watson Analytics, BeyondCore, ThoughtSpot, um, Alteryx, uh, you know, they're, like I said, every day there's a new vendor out um, in this space. But really, really about, Cognitive query, so um, it's, it's, again, running correlations, storytelling. So not just presenting a metric or a KPI, but explaining why it is what it is and what impacts, what drives um, the, the outcomes there. And then um, the other thing is, is the natural language capability. So being able to ask questions um, without having to understand SQL or R and, and that's, that's a key thing we'll talk about. But the, the, on this spectrum, one important uh, concept here is, the con is being biased. So going back to you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. When we're writing traditional BI reports capabilities, it's based on that quadrant we talked about what we know. The smart data discovery platforms don't care. They're going to crunch through all of your data sets and, and help you understand what's really driving the outcomes. So use cases for smart data discovery, I won't go through all these, but there are a ton of uh, really valid, valuable uh, use cases here. We talked about, you know, in, in uh, marketing or sales, price elasticity of demand. Um, we want to reduce customer churn, cross-sell, upsell, and sales. We want to be able to understand what drives win or loss on a deal. Opportunity ranking based on a lot of uh, details around activity and things like that. Operations inventory. So we want to make sure we're optimizing inventory levels and, and reducing waste. Um, big one in, uh, in the utility industry is understanding demand and making sure we're producing or buying the right amount of energy at the right time. And looking at weather, um, one of our projects was, is with a large weather company here in Atlanta to help uh, create data as a service that could be 
leveraged by utility companies to predict how much energy they're going to need um, based on weather predictions or insurance companies to predict, hey, there's going to be a hailstorm in this zip code. We need to send out, you know, adjusters and, and um, reps into that area. Customer support, again, successful resolution, cross sell upsell there. So a lot of opportunities. Um, and social media is really interesting to gain insight into brand uh, sentiment, um, to be able to have competitive awareness, understand intent to purpose, purchase, how do we create conversions, a um, lot of different opportunities there. So smart data discovery, what does that really mean? So it's really, again, providing business um, or data scientists with insights without requiring them to have um, data science expertise. So if you want to have this solution available to a larger number of business users, um, smart data discovery gives you that capability. Um, but you can have that in parallel with your other uh, reporting and analytic needs. There are, again, many vendors starting to pop up every day that are disrupting the traditional um, landscape of business intelligence. So really need to keep uh, an eye on those platforms because some of these startups are, um, are really innovative, uh, but we want to make sure they're mature. And then as these tools become more accessible, we, as BI leaders, we need to plan to include those in our suite of tools um, and identify some use cases that uh, will give us some quick wins and um, introduce those into our business community. The other thing they can do is really confirm or challenge things that we've done based on biased uh, traditional reporting by, again, letting the data very objective, no human um, agendas applied. It's really, you know, ones and zeros don't lie. So let's look at that and, and interpret the, the results and, again, either confirm or challenge our existing thought thinking process. So I'll just blast through this, but key thing is um, vendors, vendors are going to be converging. Uh, the number of scientists will grow five times faster than um, the citizens of the scientists. That means businesses that are able to leverage uh, these types of technologies will grow five times faster than the number of your traditional quant uh, data scientists. So that's really important to understand that um, the role of the analyst on the business side with the business lens, not the technical lens, is going to be growing very quickly. So um, the other key thing is smart data discovery, which again includes natural language query, will be the most in-demand platform um, within the user experience paradigm. So, we really need to start thinking about these things uh, to enable the business with these capabilities. And again, by 2018, um, search-based, visual-based data discovery will converge with self-service um, and natural language uh, generation capabilities. And I'll show some of that within um, the Watson Analytics platform. So we talked about a couple of different technologies. Uh, one example is IBM Watson Analytics. Uh, it is a cloud-based analytic platform. Um, the key capabilities are uploading your data set. It will automatically uh, assess the quality of all rows and columns and, and give you some insight into that. But it also allows you to uh, prepare, so to create derived columns, filter, um, cleanse, you know, it's not an extensive set of capabilities like if you had a, um, a you know, a, a InfoSphere data stage or an Informatica or, you know, some other um, data preparation platform. But for for what it uh, is intended to do, it's, it's very effective. Um, it can do predictive analytics, so understanding outcomes. So if in this example, claim amount, what drives claim amount? So it's going to... Uh, analyze the data, and I don't know if you guys can see the detail, but the uh, vehicle class in number of policies really drives as a, you know, 65% correlation to claim amount. So 
high-end vehicles um, are obviously going to have larger claims because they're more expensive to, to repair. Um, but it's really easy to engage with this platform. It has guided exploration, so it'll actually, uh, once you upload your data set, um, and we'll talk about that from a security standpoint, but once you upload your data set, it will automatically tell you the questions you should be asking. So that's really interesting that it finds those correlations and helps us use natural query language um, uh, to natural language to, to explore our data. And then share insights so you can create dashboards with all the different findings and um, provide that in a collaborative way out to um, our data. And the key thing with you know these platforms, you can come up with this analysis in minutes. We had one customer that provides um, digital signage and uh, point of sale systems for entertainment industries, so movie theaters, uh, venue, uh, sporting venues, things like that. They have a uh, di data scientist using um, SPSS, IBM, and uh, they gave us a data set. We uploaded it into Watson Analytics. Uh, I should mention we are business partners with IBM, but we are vendor agnostic. We're business partners a lot of uh, different vendors. But we took their data set, uploaded it into IBM Watson Analytics, um, and within a couple hours, their data scientist said, you guys have already uncovered more than I've been able to find in two years. So that's with two hours of using a tool like Watson Analytics. Um, so that's the key is it really can drive and, and find insights within minutes and hours uh, by leveraging all of its uh, proprietary algorithms and, and the uh, statistical models that it generates from all the correlations within your data set. So the way uh, some of these tools, I just wanted to give an overview of the capabilities and architecture. Um, so with Watson Analytics specifically, you can connect directly to uh, databases, specifically cloud databases, um, or uh, upload your data set into their secure cloud, um, which is ho hosted by software. From there, again, you do your data prep, um, and then it has three capabilities, three key capabilities. It's discovery, so it, it provides you with uh, natural uh, language um, capabilities to ask questions. It will uh, suggest uh, questions you should be asking, predictive. I can pick the outcome I'm trying to drive, um, like customer churn or margin, and it will um, identify the key things that are driving that outcome. And then display, again, is that uh, dashboard that we can combine, and it has a lot of very advanced visualization ca capabilities, um, from heat maps to scatter charts, web charts, anything um, that is appropriate for the type of analysis you're using. Now, it's not going to be as extensive as a, a Tableau, Platfora, um, but again, for what it is intended to do as being a tool for uh, business, you know, citizens, data scientists, business users, um, it does have you know significant amount of uh, of options for visualization. The other um, vendor we're going to talk about is Beyond Core. So it analyzes uh, you know, millions of combinations in minutes, provides unbiased answers and explanations uh, to really understand the metrics that drive your desired outcomes. So um, what it does is it creates a story, and we talked about the storytelling, that provides the users with predictive and prescriptive insights and that, you know, the actual drivers um, behind their, their uh, desired outcomes. So, oops. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is um, really demonstrate a couple of the tools um, that we have that will, um, like I said, Beyond Core in IBM Watson Analytics. And what I'm going to start with is IBM Watson Analytics. So my kids uh, have three children, and this Pokemon Go thing is uh, – been a little bit crazy, so I wanted to look at sentiment analysis. Um, you know, hear about all of these uh, accidents and things that are, are going on with Pokemon. So I really thought that there would be a fairly negative 
uh, sentiment around Pokemon Go. And I'm going to show you how we built this. Um, I was actually surprised to see these results. You know, there is actually um, a fairly uh, large percentage um, of people that are neutral, but um, there are a significant amount of uh, folks that have a positive um, view of, of Pokemon Go. So I'm guessing parents are really uh, tweeting a whole lot about it, and <laughs> the users probably are. Um, but what we can do is look at uh, the topic. So I created, I'll show you how we create the topic. So this is mentions. This is, again, this is for social media. So it is analyzing Twitter, uh, video channels, blogs, things like that. So what's interesting is the amount of mentions in, in the increase uh, from the time that Pokemon launched. And what we can do is um, break this down and filter so you can see the different data elements that are automatically pulled in um, by Watson's uh, analytics social media. And I can add things to, um, to this chart. For instance, I can add, let's look at positive mentions. So if I go back to the topic mentions, I can look at the sentiment. So how many are positive? Um, so of the 20 or so thousand, um, there are about 5,000 that are positive. Let's look at negative. It's only about 1,800 negative mentions. Um, based on the sentiment. Now, it automatically determines the sentiment based on words, uh, so unstructured text analysis of the actual mention. Um, and that's proprietary uh, that um, is built into the social media capability. The other thing we can do is look at uh, mentions by country. So let's look at United States, United Kingdom, So breaks down by day. And let, let me show you how this actually works. So what you do is you create a topic um, that you're interested in. So here I've created a topic for Pokemon, different uh, variations. The accent characters are treated differently. Um, so these are the terms we're looking at. And context terms are things that, are surround, uh, that surround the terms that you've included that we want to look at. And what it does is automatically analyzes uh, Twitter and other things and shows you um, some keywords that you might be interested in. So it actually is guiding you in, in deciding uh, what context you want. Then we can create themes. Uh, so we look at safety, accidents, dangers, age, things like that. And uh, so from there, we can decide date range, languages, I've only selected English here, and then our sources. So here we have Twitter, forums, uh, YouTube, video sites, blogs, news, things like that. So that's one example of the social media capability. I'm also going to show you an executive summary um, for a chief marketing officer. Now these are um, part of their expert data sets that you can um, import for demonstration purposes. Uh, so we can look at some of the analysis that were created here by this data set. Now this is for a uh, telecom company, and it's looking at the uh, traffic across their uh, the bandwidth usage by application. So you can see here that YouTube has a significant um, is a significant favorite, in, uh, but over here on the left, you can add uh, you know, your comments. Netflix is now second largest. Spotify has grown considerably. Um, you know, a lot of really interesting things we can, we can do within our data set. The other thing, like I said, is a natural query capability. So here is the predetermined um, questions that Watson Analytics has found within your data um, that 
again, are the questions that things you should be asking. Um, and it automatically comes up with these based on the correlations that it's found. But you can also ask your own questions. So what is the trend of volume total over date by application? And what it's going to do is it's going to pick the, um, the, the chart or visualization that it thinks is most appropriate for this, um, this type of analysis. So we have data as our x-axis. We have volume here by application type. Um, and I can change these just by uh, selecting different uh, metrics or dimensions. It also gives me a lot of other insights. Uh, I can change the visualization type. Um, a lot of really interesting things here. So the other key capability is the predictive. Um, so what we're going to do is I forgot to show you the, the data set, actually, the preparation capabilities. Um, this is the actual data that it's analyzing, so it gives you a user interface to um, interact with that. So and we'll, we'll get to questions here in a minute. I see a lot of uh, comments there, but just wanted to show you some of the key um, capabilities here. And again, the analytics exchange is um, a set of expert storybooks that you can import um, and look into uh, how IBM and other users have uh, created the analysis um, to base your own uh, solutions um, from that. So what I wanted to show was, again, different demo dashboard data. I can edit this here, but what I want to do is discovery. Oops. Sorry. So again, this is what we were doing. Um, with the questions and answers, but now I can go into predictive analytics. So I need to give it a target. I'm still computing. I'll come back to this one. I'm going to go to Beyond Core. So what we talked about earlier was um, patient data. So this is looking at excess stay um, by diagnosis. So it automat I did not create this. Anything that you see written on the screen, I had zero, um, there was zero effort in, in creating this. This is automatically generated um, by Beyondcore on their data set. All I did is say, I'm interested in excess stay. It said, Diagnosis is a key contributor um, to excess stay. And then it goes into more detail. Um, septicemia, except in labor, and congestive heart failure have a significant, um, uh, you know, standard deviation, uh, excess of standard deviation for extended stay. So those are things that we really want to look at. But it goes into a lot more detail than that. So here are some cases when excess stay is worse than average. Uh, but it says what is influence. Admission type, when it's emergency, it's two times more often. Congestive heart failure um, is influenced by admission type but emergency. Some things are pretty obvious. But the other part that um, is really interesting, gives you some other things that it finds are relevant to your data set. So when facility is, um, here's one that's emergency or um, hospital 
that we can look into. <laughs> okay, so here's our uh, the ability to choose a data source. So here I have my patient stay. Um, we're looking at excess stay. So from there, I just wanted to show you how we created that story. It's very simple. Here's where I can prepare data. So it tells me the columns I can create, change data for formats, add derived columns, look up tables, um, all sorts of stuff there. And when I go to set up my story, I'm going to tell it what's my variable, excess stay. This is patient visits. Unit is day. Higher excess stay is bad. So it's analyzing all the combinations of the columns, so all the permutations there, and it's doing statistical models, generating graphs and explanations. Uh, and it does this relatively quickly. I mean, it's not a um, instantaneous uh, analysis, but even in a webinar, we can um, wait a couple seconds here before it comes up with the explanation. But really, I just wanted to show you um, the capability. So it says that uh, we can improve by adjusting some of the uh, columns and, and adjusting data. We're going to skip that, but it's pretty um, interesting how it does that. The other thing it does is create an automated capability that talks about your evaluated 54,670 patient visits and eight columns of data across 2,219 variable combinations to determine which factors most impact excess stay. Note, overall average 0 0.332 indicated by dashed gray line. Translucent bars are not specifically important. So here it's telling us the key things that uh, drive excess stay, so we're going to look at that. And this is, again, this is how it created that chart. Now I can go into up here predictive and I want to do some what if analysis. Um, so what it's doing right now is it's running a regression um, of all of the data behind the scenes and it'll give me the capability of running some what if analysis based on uh, the different variables that we have, such as um, age, race, gender, uh, diagnosis, hospital type, um, things like that. So what I'm going to do is go back to – oh, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. We need time for questions here. So here's the what if variable um, I want to uh, look at. So I'm going to look really look about payment type. Um, how does how is the excess day um, driven by payment type? Then I'm going to look at race, age, and gender. So excess day is really driven, um, it looks like it, there is a significant correlation uh, to payment type. So Medicaid is, has a higher excess base. So let's look at um, different age groups and add that to our story. The other thing is it gets into prescriptive. Um, no, this might take a second. But anyway, I think you guys get an understanding of the capabilities of the tool that really drive um, you know, smart data discovery for end users. It's very simple. Um, the interesting thing is if you are a, a real quant, you can export um, this to R and see the R code behind it and then put that into your own um, environment if you like. Uh, you can also look at SQL and edit that manually. So 
that's really just a, a you know I wanted to give you an overview of um, the capabilities there and see the uh, the ability that we can provide end users um, by giving them um, I don't know why this is still way bought and slow today <laughs> a lot of Murphy's law here this morning um, but that's really uh, the, the key thing we wanted to cover was just giving a demonstration of capabilities. Um, three Sage, you know, all we do is turn data and insights. All we do is data. Um, a lot of firms are a mile wide and inch deep. We are uh, a mile deep in, in information management. I've uh, worked with some of Atlanta's largest companies um, in helping them become data driven and manage data as an asset. Our folks have deep business uh, acumen and technical capabilities, so they can get into a conversation and, and wear whichever hat they need to. Um, and then our depth of strategy and technology solution expertise. So that's um, key that a small team of three-stage consultants can make a big impact. Uh, we do enterprise information management strategy, so that's you know top-down, how do we become data-driven. And from there we do traditional BI, architecture integration, MDM, governance, big data, and analytics. So really, are you sitting on a gold mine? Um, how do we tap into that? Uh, strategic consulting, so uh, roadmaps, strategy, execution excellence, um, and, and then elite uh, staff um, staffing for uh, specific technologies or capabilities. So that's it. Again, your enterprise knows more than it's telling you. Um, we're excited about the capabilities that are, are you know evolving every day. Um, and hopefully this was uh, useful in helping everyone understand um, and get some more insight into smart data discovery and, and how we can empower the business users. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Um, we did have a couple questions. Um, if you do have questions right now, please ask them in the chat box, and I will be happy to ask them to Rick, and he will let us all know the answer. But our first question that we had was, um, how do you deal with inconsistent data uh, for example, alternative or misspelling of customers' names, states, countries, etc. So the ideal way of, of doing that is to have a data quality or master data management um, capability in place to uh, resolve uh, customers uniquely to correct um, a lot of the reference data like location, state, country. But those tools, as I showed you, have uh, data cleansing capabilities, so we can create mappings or have lookup tables to, or you know, with address information, it can automatically um, correct some of that stuff. But you know, there that is a problem, no matter what platform you're using or technology capability. Um, data quality is is a huge uh, impact to accuracy and trustworthiness of, of the results. Um, it's actually a very uh, important aspect to really managing data as a strategic asset. So if there isn't a formal data quality place to um, manage um, you know, those attributes, uh, it, you then have to decide either to exclude the outliers um, by filtering or, like I said, leverage some of the um, data cleansing capabilities within the tool. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, I think that was a good answer. Um, and then I had another question. Can the slide deck be shared with the learners today? Yes, absolutely. So I would assume that if they want that, they can just directly email you. Would that be okay? Uh, directly email would be fine. It's uh, displayed on the screen now. Um, I would reach out to Brad Bowden. Uh, he's our VP of uh, Business Development and Strategy, so he would have uh, – the deck can be able to answer any questions. Perfect. Well, that was all the questions we got in today. Rick, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, we appreciate you uh, speaking with us today and sharing all this valuable information. And like we said at the beginning of the session, uh, the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and check it out. So, Rick, thank you so much again. We really appreciate you helping out today. Thank you, Perry. Thanks, Tag. Thanks to everybody out there. And again, sorry for the uh, snafus on uh, automatically being logged out, but uh, appreciate your patience and um, 
and again, if you have any questions, please reach out to Brad or myself and uh, we'll be happy to um, either give a more detailed demonstration, uh, discuss you know, your um, uh, plans to potentially integrate this, these types of smart data discovery platforms or build a roadmap to do so.